I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about Repatha. Repatha is a newly available drug that is capable of dramatically reducing your bad cholesterol. So the typical story is you go see the doctor, you've had a heart attack, maybe you're at risk for a heart attack. Doctor says your bad cholesterol is too high, so we're going to start you on a medicine. We're going to start you on one of the statin drugs, maybe Lipitor or a Torvastatin. Maybe we're going to start you on Simvastatin, or it could be Crestor. And after you start taking these drugs at maximal dose, your bad cholesterol is still too high. So now what? Well, a chance discovery in a laboratory in 2003 showed that people who had elevated levels of PCSK9 had high levels of cholesterol. Several years later, they found another case where there was low level of PCSK9, and in those people, the likelihood of heart attacks was low, as was the LDL. So that led to some investigation in the laboratory, and they came up with a monoclonal antibody to the PCSK9 so that, in effect, you could lower it. And Evolucumab, or Repatha, was born. It was engineered in Chinese hamster ovarian cells. That's very typical in the laboratory. They developed a subcutaneous injection of this material that you give yourself either every two weeks or every four weeks. It blocks the PCSK9, and when it blocks the PCSK9, the PCSK9 cannot block a receptor on the liver cells that's responsible for gobbling up bad cholesterol. So if it doesn't block those receptors, then the bad cholesterol keeps getting gobbled up by the liver, and the amount in the bloodstream falls quite dramatically. Well, the chemicals, the statins, and the PCSK9 inhibitors work completely differently in the body. They hopefully achieve the same goal of lowering the bad cholesterol, but the repatha is much stronger. Anytime we deal with any chemicals that are involved in central metabolism, there's going to be some other areas where they also involve themselves beyond what we're looking for. So it seems PCSK9 is involved in sodium reabsorption from the kidney, maybe involved in viral or bacterial infections or sepsis or obesity or glucose metabolism. Well, the company worked very quickly, Amgen Pharmaceuticals, to start developing this monoclonal antibody. They were able to get a biologic license application from the FDA in late 2014, and by late 2015, the drug Repatha was approved for marketing here in the United States for people who had elevated levels of cholesterol. They had been treated with other kind of medicines, the statins, and they had atherosclerotic disease or a tendency to it. We have pre-filled syringes that you can get. You store them in the refrigerator, take them out half hour before you use them. You give yourself an injection in the upper thigh, in the abdomen, or in the arm. And if you're going on vacation, you can keep the drug out of the refrigerator for up to a month. In February of 2017, Amgen made a public announcement that they had evidence that their drug, Repatha, significantly reduced the risk of cardiovascular events in people who had clinical evidence of coronary artery disease, atherosclerotic coronary vascular disease. And that evidence was published in March of 2017 in the New England Journal at the same time, New England Journal of Medicine at the same time, it was delivered at the American College of Cardiology meeting in New Orleans. The study was known as Repatha. Repatha looked at 27,000 people who were involved in the study, and these people had an average bad cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, of 92. These people were taking maximum doses of the statins, and that's as low as they could get it. The doctors wanted it less than 70. The study was performed in 1,242 different sites throughout the world. It was done in 49 different countries. Amgen, the maker of the drug, designed the study, helped write the paper, was the sponsor of the study, and was responsible for collecting all of the data. Now, we like conflict-free doctors to do the evaluation. 
So that's considered a conflict of interest. When there's a conflict of interest, then there's some money that's being exchanged. And, and we have question about how reliable the information is. It could be very reliable, but, but there's always that conflict if somebody's getting some money from something. Well, the 12 authors had 43 pages of conflict of information, conflict of interest. That's an awful lot. Some of the countries where the study was performed, not just in America, but it was also performed in the Ukraine, in Romania, in Mexico, in Malaysia. It was performed in Hungary, in Bulgaria, in Colombia. Hmm. Not the greatest medical centers in the entire world, I suspect. But anyway, the patients who were evaluated were between the ages of 40 and 85. They had clinical evidence of coronary vascular disease or hardening of the arteries. In 80% of the people, there was a history of a heart attack and 20% a history of a stroke and 13% history of peripheral artery disease. And they had at least one other major characteristic that put them at risk. Either they had diabetes or they were more than age 65 when they were randomized to the study or they had a history of a heart attack or a stroke within six months or they were smokers even though they were at such high risk or they had a history of peripheral artery disease, or instead of the one major, they could have two minor risk factors. Minor risk factor might be that they had an elevated level in the bloodstream of a uh, marker of inflammation. Maybe they had the bad cholesterol over 130, or maybe the good cholesterol was less than 40 in a man or less than 50 in a woman. Maybe there was a history that they had a non-heart attack related angioplasty or bypass surgery or they could have had the metabolic syndrome with elevated blood pressure and maybe elevated blood sugar and big waistline. That 80% of the people also had high blood pressure, a third of them had diabetes. And interestingly, one in four smoked cigarettes, they were on lots of other medicines for treatment of their high blood pressure and for reduction of the likelihood of clotting. And interestingly, within, within one month of taking the drug, the cholesterol, the bad cholesterol level fell from an average of 92 to an average of about 30. And as a matter of fact, in 40% of the people, the bad cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol, was less than 25. So that's very good. So if we look at the numbers, there's no question that if we look just at the numbers, it is a remarkable success. We were able to reduce, or they were able to reduce, the bad cholesterol by about 60%. They were able to reduce some of the other markers of heart disease quite significantly. They had a decrease of about 16% in the triglycerides. The good cholesterol went up. All that is very good. So they looked at the combined endpoints. That was the primary goal. Now there are five combined endpoints, so they grouped all of these together and they found a 15% reduction when you look at the incidence of heart attack, incidence of stroke, incidence of heart attack related death, incidence of hospitalization for chest pain, and the incidence of revascularization. So when you look at all of those five together, there's a 15% reduction, but now wait a minute, that's a relative risk reduction. What's the real risk reduction? The real risk reduction was in people taking Repatha, there was little less than 10% incidence of all of those combined. In the people taking the statins alone, there was little more than an 11%. So that means there was only a 1.5% difference between the people taking the drug and the people not taking the drug. And if we look at the major combined endpoints, so the secondary goal was look at heart attack, stroke, and heart attack related death, they say that there's a 20% reduction, but when we look at the numbers, it's still, again, there's only 1.5% difference, a difference in the placebo group at 7.4%, uh, a reduction in the Repatha group, 5.9%. So we only have a 1.5% difference. And in a study that cost a billion dollars to do, more was expected as far as the results were concerned. The benefits, according to the American Heart Association, were really kind of modest and, and not quite what they were looking for. And as a matter of fact, the day the study was announced, the price on the stock market of the pharmaceutical company fell. Now, let's take a look at some of the absolute numbers. So if we look at heart attack-related deaths, what's the difference between the Repatha group and the statin-only group? Remember, the Repatha group got the Repatha plus the statins versus the statins only. 
So if we look at those 13,780 people in each group who were at high risk, well, we find that there were only 25 heart attack-related deaths in the group that was getting the Repatha. Compare that to 30 in the group getting just the statins. And we find that overall, when we look at the 13,000 people, the differences are minuscule. And the same thing with stroke-related problems. Find 31 strokes in the Repatha group and 33 in the group getting the statin only. And if we look at the all-cause mortality, interestingly, there were more people who died taking Repatha than there were in the group taking the statins only. 444 versus 426. But again, the overwhelming majority of the people at high risk, all of these people were at high risk, the overwhelming majority of people live just happily ever after. So we don't have any significant benefit when we look at the numbers. And as a matter of fact, a very famous cardiologist from Yale University, Dr. Harlan Krumholtz, he said that maybe we're just performing cosmetic surgery on a laboratory value, that LDL. We're looking at the LDL so much we forget about what might really be the potential problem. Because when we drop the LDL so dramatically, the death rate doesn't fall so dramatically. In fact, it doesn't really fall at all. There's another drug that's on the market. It's called Praluent. It's made by Sanofi and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. And they're aiming to keep the bad cholesterol not in the 30s, but in the 40s or 50s. What's the ideal level for the LDL? We don't know. Some time ago it was around 125. Then it was less than 125. Then it was around 100. Now it's around 70. And some people are trying to say, well, it ought to be around 30. Well, this drug, Repatha, is very expensive. It costs about $14,500 per year to take the drug. It's estimated that the insurance company is going to have to pay about a million dollars to save one person. Some people would suggest that to save one person, it's going to require 74 people treated for two years, prevent one death, cost in excess of $2,100,000. Now this suggested that we would have to treat 200 people for two years to prevent three fewer events, the events heart attack, stroke, or heart attack related death. Now the outcomes are not really all that impressive. They're not that impressive when we look at the cardiovascular mortality or all-cause mortality. The one good thing is that the side effects aren't really significantly different from placebo, at least so far. More will come out, I'm sure, over a period of time. Now, Amgen Pharmaceuticals estimates that 11 million people might be potential candidates to take this drug, and they think that maybe, actually they salivate, that this drug could bring in $4 billion or $5 billion in revenue. But the analysts say, hey, we were expecting 25% reduction in events, and you didn't even give it to us. And as a matter of fact, most of the studies on statin drugs last for four or five years. This study was planned to last four years, but because there were so many events, events, heart attacks and strokes and all of that, well, it was cut short at only two years. So remember, in terms of the individual outcomes, not significantly different. There's no benefit in all-cause mortality, no significant real effect on cardiovascular mortality, no significant benefit if we look at the hospitalization for unstable angina, no change in the hospitalization for worsening congestive heart failure. And if we look at the cost, we can evaluate standardly the quality adjusted life years. How much does it cost to give a person one adjusted quality life year longer of life? And typically in the United States we say $100,000 is how much we should estimate. So anything that costs more than $100,000 for a quality adjusted life year is just too expensive. Things that are less are better. Actually when I started in medicine it was $50,000 was the break point. But now it's $100,000 and if we look at Repatha the cost for one quality adjusted life here is $400,000 to $500,000, and that's just absolutely too much. And if we drop the cost of the drug, instead of $14,000 plus a year, if it was only, say, $4,500, it would just come in at $100,000 for a quality adjusted life here. 
And back when I started, it would have to fall all the way down to about $2,200. So the benefit actually was not statistically significant in the study that was performed in Europe or in Latin America. It was only a benefit in the United States, in America, North America, and in Asia. And non-Caucasians seem to benefit more than Caucasians. Women seem to benefit more than men. And the companies are having actually some difficulty convincing the insurance companies to allow marketing of the drug or allow coverage of the drug. So they've cut some deals. And the deals are, well, look, if one of the patients who's taking the drug has a heart attack or a stroke, we'll pay you back. We'll give you the money. Whatever it costs you to buy our drug, we'll give you that money back. So that's kind of peculiar, don't you think? And now we find that there's another problem. It just takes too much time for the doctor's office to get approval for the drug. All the paperwork that's involved, and as a matter of fact, the commercial insurance companies reject the requests for the medicine about 75% of the time in 2016, and Medicare rejects it in about 61%. And typically, there are lawsuits involved. So Amgen is suing Regeneron and Sanofi, and vice versa. They're suing them over the patent, over the medicine, all sorts of things. So it's pretty dirty. There's a lot of high pressure behind the scenes court activity in spite of the fact that the drug companies have a smile on their face and they say, oh my goodness, our drug is just absolutely so good. Interestingly, Pfizer, another major pharmaceutical company here in the United States and throughout the world, produced a medicine in the same family, Bocosizumab, and that drug in phase three testing, so it already was being tested in patients, already for a year in patients. And it was thought to be good until it reached that year mark. And then, unfortunately, there was a deterioration in the drug's efficacy. It didn't seem to work anymore. So what's my take on the drug? Well, first of all, we're not exactly sure that LDL is the answer to the story. Everyone's talking about LDL, or you've got to reduce the LDL. But here we have quite clear evidence that even though we dramatically reduce the LDL, we're not able to reduce the incidence of heart-related disease or all-cause mortality. And the drug is simply too expensive. The evidence behind it is too little. The drug company is out there hyping it. But unfortunately, every time you hear some hyping of drugs, you have to think, now what's the difference between hyping of a drug and hyping of a car, hyping of a potato chip or a fast food or some kind of a restaurant or a cereal or a lawyer or a doctor's office? Hey, this advertising stuff is bad because it gives you the wrong idea. Scientifically, we just don't have the data to support this medicine. So we have to be very careful, especially when the drug costs so doggone much. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.